have like hundreds of years of evolutionary theory, right? But it was all elaborated for things that were organisms or populations that were thrown into environments where they were unhappy and then their fitness goes up. But what I've done, what, what sort of pollution does in a lot of cases, so nutrient enrichment around coasts or high CO2, or if you live somewhere that's kind of a bit too cold, elevated temperature. So, you know, if you don't live at the equator, actually a little bit of warmth is positive for a lot of organisms. Um, not everyone, but a lot of them. We didn't have any evolutionary theory for what happens when the environment gets better, right? So I was working with hundreds of years of theory about environments getting worse. And um, so I, had, I just switched off what I was thinking. I just sort of said, oh, it's not, I have set up the experiment wrong in that evolution experiments are about bad environments and I'm doing experiments about good environments. And so I started thinking, well, what happens when the environment just keeps getting better? And well, organisms aren't adapted to that. They're adapted to environments being good transiently. And so this is sort of like, if you're adapted to eating a normal amount of food and you happen upon a buffet once a year, twice a year, um, especially if you're usually kind of broke and kind of not getting enough food, you should definitely throw yourself on that buffet, stuff your pockets, like go for it, right? And we, we've all done this adaptively as 19 year olds, right? We were sort of like peanut butter sandwich, peanut butter sandwich, peanut butter sandwich, free pizza, right? And then you just eat really untoward amounts of pizza. And then the question becomes, well, what if there's free pizza every day? And the answer is, you definitely shouldn't eat it every day, but there would be no reason in a normal environment to evolve that off switch, right? And so the organisms, these, these guys in these high CO2 environments, usually when there's lots of nutrients, the adaptive thing to do is grow super fast because the nutrients will run out. And then, um, then you deal with that later. And it turns out when you grow super fast, you have to, and this will make complete sense when you say it, you have to rev your metabolism super fast. And we all actually know what happens when you rev your metabolism super fast, which is that you oxidize. This is not a problem if the environment gets better, because then you stop growing, and while you stop growing, you fix, you make your antioxidants. But if you never stop growing, then eventually your good environment externally turns into a bad environment internally. And then what, what evolution was doing was dealing with that internal environment. And so what I was getting was not selection for growth at high CO2. I was getting high CO2 driving selection for growth with high internal oxidi oxidation, right? And then when I started re revisiting all my old experiments from that, I began to see the evidence of that, right? And so that just sort of took off without me at that point. It was really fun. Things just slotted into place. Um, but I really did have a period where I was working on it because I was really sure I had done something stupid and I wanted to find the 10 year mistake before somebody else did. And there was just a lot of, oh my God, maybe I should quit science if I'm this, this inept, you know? Um, so it turned right around. Know, you, it turned you, around. It showed something came back. Yeah. Um, revealed itself. Yeah, well, but I did, it wasn't like a big revelation. I really, I make it sound like I had this moment, but really I like, shit. Shift. And when I look back on it, there were all sorts of indicators that I didn't see, right? Um, so the pattern was revealed to you. Yeah, by that at some point there was just enough of a pattern that I started looking, and then I, and then I was like, oh, that would explain this weird result and this weird result and this other really weird result. But it sounds to me like a big shift happened in your mind mm -hmm. when you realized you. You had to think about it yeah. in a completely opposite way. Yeah, but the I'm irony is, if I went back to the very first paper I've ever written, we make that analogy. <laughs> but we just threw it off the cuff. Like, I didn't really internalize it. Um, so it's pretty funny. There's, like, right there in the first paper. There's sort of... Um, I remember talking about it with my PhD supervisor, and the way he, he was like, so what we're saying is at high CO2, they become sort of fat and lazy. And so he had... He had already phrased it as um, there's something something bad about this environment um, because the cells had become quite big and quite slow. Um, and we, I guess because there was like no way for me to think about evolution in good environments, there was just no, no theory on that. 
people are like, yeah, but you move into a good environment and another nutrient becomes limiting. And then you move into, you know, something will always be limiting. So there's all this idea of thinking about the worst bit, but not sort of thinking about, well, absolutely, how fast does that mean you run your metabolism? Because even something will always be limiting. But the question is, I realized the, the important thing was realizing, yeah, it's not like you have no limit, but the limit is now in absolute terms higher than before. So, you know, I remember you telling me this story years, a couple of years ago when mm-hmm. I first met you, and you, you put it in terms of there being a little parable here mm-hmm. for people today. Do, you want to, do I remember my parable? Well, it was about, basically about living within limits. Yeah, the, what they had to do was evolve a way to be slow again, these algae. So it was really interesting. So what they do is, in most of them, um, do something that I call prodigal sun dynamics, which is really fun. I really enjoy maybe an evolutionary phenomenon after a Bible story. <laughs> I don't know if I should have enjoyed it quite that much, but I did, um, was, yeah, the idea is that by living fast and hard, these things accumulated so much internal damage that the only sort of route to survival was to slow everything down, which in sort of their ancestral environment would have been unthinkable. Slowing down when, when you're limited is stupid, right? If you're, if you're just struggling to stay alive, then, then restraining yourself could result in death. But if you're so full of resources that the main danger to yourself is sort of the consumption of those resources and the use of those resources in a fast and furious way, then you have to find a way to, to hold them back. Um, and I find that, I mean, it is an interesting parable, um, or I mean, there's a reason I picked a parable, right? Um, but I think, you have to be really careful, like taking taking these things and anthropomorphizing them too much, because um, you can also look at it as like the environment, um, the thing driving evolution, um, starting off as an external environment and then shifting to, as a result of the external change, shifting to the internal environment, right? And I also think that's sort of a nice way to think about it. Of, um, what had to come under control was the internal environment of the cell. It was no longer a question of dealing with the carbon supply. It was a matter of dealing with these sort of stress responses. 